Hello, everybody. Welcome to our show tonight. Uh, we have a really exciting show. There's been a lot of big changes here on the Homesteady Farm uh, that we want to catch you up on, and we're excited to talk about them. And the topic that we're going to cover in depth, we're going to talk about finishing up our, um, our what's the word, earthworks, our big earthworks projects. And uh, then we're going to get into the big question that we keep asking ourselves now. We've changed the whole layout of our farm. We've changed the homestead, how it works, and we're ready to bring on some new animals, hopefully some new meat animals, Um, maybe some bigger ones, maybe a lot more smaller ones. Uh, So we'll get into that discussion about choosing some meat animals for the homestead, uh, our thoughts behind it, uh, what we like to do, and uh, what you might consider doing on your homestead. And as always, we'll be taking questions at the end, and if you'd like to call in, we'll post the phone number for that. Uh, So join in the conversation with us tonight. So we're going to dive into these topics tonight. So stay tuned with us, and uh, we'll get into all this and more as we discuss finishing up our earthworks and choosing some livestock for your homestead. So thanks for joining us, guys. So I'm here tonight, uh, getting ready to talk to you guys, and I have my sidekick here. My six-year-old is learning how to run the video and uh, audio mixer, uh, so he's going to wave hello to everybody. Right there, buddy. Go ahead and wave. They can see you. Wave? No? <laughs> there we go. We, uh, I got him as part of, you know, we homeschool the kids, so we're, we're teaching him how to run the live show, how to run the different video feeds and audio feeds, and uh, he's going to help us out tonight with all you guys. So welcome to the show. Thanks for joining us, everybody over at Prepper Broadcasting. Looks like we got uh, Jay Fergie, Ren Man, Dis- Diascribe, I think. Uh, uh, who else? Flying Dutchman. Thanks for joining us, guys. Zeta3. And then over in YouTube, we have Tagwell Farms, Ben Newman, Mercy, Farmer in the Della. Pretty good, guys. I like that name. We got Dad Isaac Go Gardening. They've changed how they spell their YouTube name. Much easier to understand, guys. Appreciate that. Greenbrier Farms. Uh, Renate, Renat, I think it is. Ben says, woohoo, it's homesteading night. Thanks, guys. A wonderful, blessed life and the garden channel saying hello. So thanks for joining us, everybody who's there in the, in the chat boxes. If you have questions... Um, if you have questions, be sure to let us know, tag at Homesteady in the chat box so those stand out. We'll be taking your questions towards the end of the night. So as we get towards the end, we'll, we'll go through all the questions that are there. And if you'd like to call in, there's a phone number that we'll post in the chat boxes uh, so that you can call in and uh, share your stories of uh, choosing meat for your farm, and uh, maybe any big projects that you've been doing on the farm. So thanks for joining us for this episode, guys. Let's get into the updates from the Homesteady Farm. So you guys have heard a lot. We've been talking about this. The uh, winter and spring, we did this huge earthworks project over at our at our place we had a really big excavator it was a uh two i want to say it was a 270 size don't remember don't remember exactly should have wrote it down but a really nice size machine and we spent a lot of time in that thing just cutting in roads filling improving our pastures improving the amount of area that we have for pasture and then we had a couple weeks back, we did a couple YouTube videos on it. We were able to get out there and start planting all of our pasture mix. We did a mix of peas and beans and, <clears throat> excuse me, Timothy. And that 
We also, in certain areas, we put some clover, some red clover, and some rye grass. So just a nice mix of different forages. And with the idea of putting in really good high quality pastures. We'll talk about a little bit later the problems we had in the past with not good pasture. Uh, but now the Homesteady Farm has a brand new road right into our barn so we can bring deliveries of feed and hay, which is incredibly important. We have uh, probably three times as much pasture as we had before. So that's been fantastic. And uh, we really enjoy that. And um, we also have one of the coolest parts of it. We've cleared a lot of the forest. We've we've opened it up. We've left the really good quality trees, some really big oaks and maples, uh, some birches, a couple of the really large hemlocks we've kept. But for the most part, we took a lot of the scrub brush down, the low quality stuff, and it's just opened up the woods. You know the saying, seeing the forest through the trees. It's allowed us to see the forest through the trees. And the views are just, they're just spectacular. It's just beautiful. So we've really been enjoying this. And I, I think we have plans over the years. We've decided that our entire 10 acres, right now we're only really using one or two of them. And this, this has improved it to maybe using three, three and a half, maybe four acres. But we have plans now after doing this, this last winter and spring to just extend what we've done and continue to open up until hopefully nine or 10 acres full of just usable, nice pasture, good for wildlife. That's one of the cool things is when you open up the forest and let the undergrowth come up, it's not only good for your animals and your pastures, but it's better quality forage for wildlife. You get more birds, you get more you know, you see bunnies running around. And if you're a hunter, you'll bring more deer and turkeys in. So it's really a win-win-win. Good for your livestock, good for the forest, good for the animals. It, it brings a property to life. A property that's been essentially kind of a wasteland since before we moved on to it. A pretty one, but not really valuable to wildlife at all. Now it's going to be just full and lush and really usable. When you think of what a homestead is, I think a homestead, as opposed to a, a house, which is a consuming, you know, people buy a house, it consumes. It consumes fuel, it consumes time and money. A homestead is a producing property, a property where you get things back from that property and from that house at home. And uh, this is a great way to do it, just opening up and bringing the woods to life. So we're really excited for these changes. And it's going to mean, it's going to bring a lot of improvements onto our property and uh, with our farm. Our farm business, a lot of you know, is primarily just meat. We do other things. We do raise, you know, egg laying chickens. We have a garden. We talked about putting in the orchard and all those things mostly are for us and to, you know, share on the YouTube channel and through the podcast and the live shows. Um, but our business, the farm business, is primarily focused excuse me, on pork. And a little bit, we used to do chicken too. We don't do so much chicken anymore. Uh, but we've decided, you know, over the years of trying different things, meat was just a really great way to produce something of quality. It was easy enough to grow. You don't lose most of your meat animals. You can lose some meat chickens, but if you do them right, you won't lose too many. And in addition to it being easy to grow, like pigs, I mean, I've never lost a pig. We did have them get sick one time. It looked a little scary for a little while, but they've always done really, really well. We've never lost even one pig. Uh, the, the, another benefit to me is there's, it's a premium market. People are willing to pay more money for farm fresh meat. Uh, so that's really nice. It's pretty easy to sell good quality farm fresh meat. Uh, and the, the reason why, and this is another reason why we've decided that meat is just the best endeavor on our farm is farm fresh meat is worlds different from store bought conventionally raised meat. You know, if you grow farm fresh lettuce, I'm sure it has some benefits, you know, maybe some health benefits over, uh, you know, buying lettuce at the supermarket. 
maybe you can taste a difference in your farm fresh lettuce. I'm not trying to knock farm fresh lettuce, but it's just not exciting as farm fresh bacon. And I don't think there's anybody in the chat box tonight who'd argue with that. Uh, so farm fresh pork, farm fresh chicken, it's just really delicious. And that goes on, you know, the list gets bigger and bigger. There's farm fresh, you know, beef, uh, you can do lamb. You know, all sorts of things. Duck. We did some duck this year, which has turned out to be really, really well. So we have focused our farm business. We've realized that meat is the king for us. We have a goal every year to make at least $2,500 in uh, gross revenue from our farm business. And the reason that figure, it's not out of the blue. Uh, to get t sales tax exempt, you have to make a minimum of that every year. So that's our minimum goal. And... Uh, so that's kind of our target, and meat's a really easy way to hit that target. You got to sell a lot of vegetables to make that kind of money, uh, but you can sell a couple pigs, you know, a dozen or so chickens, and you'll get to that price without too much, you know, work, especially in Connecticut. I know there's some of you out there who comment on our videos and say, You charge how much for your stuff? That's crazy. I'd never spend that. If you lived in Connecticut, you'd have to spend that. That's kind of uh, the way it is. I can see in the chat box, Tagwell Farm says, Farm Fresh Lettuce excites me more than bacon. All right, guys, I stand corrected. One person in the chat box wanted to argue with that. I'm shocked. <laughs> so, uh, oh, no, they said, said no one ever. Okay, good. I wasn't wrong. Thanks, guys. Way to confuse me. <laughs> All right, so meat has been our goal. And for the last five years, we have been focused on pork and chicken for our own family and for the local community. And the reason why is, uh, there's a couple reasons why we thought that was the best, pork and chicken. So first let's get into that. The so let's talk about why we've picked pork and chicken primarily for our farm's business. Uh, in the beginning, chickens, I mean, they're the gateway to everything. They're the gateway to animals. They're the great, the gateway to, uh, you know, kind of farming for a lot of people. And it was no different for us. We got into chickens because it's easy to raise meat chickens. You can do it without too much effort. And they turn out a really good product. So for us, it was a good way to get started, get something for sale. Over time, we realized meat chickens were hard to get a premium price for and uh, tough to reach that $2,500 figure with just doing chickens on the scale that we were doing. And so then we dove into pigs. Now, Chicken and pig, but mostly pig and pork, and you know, the pork in our area, there's a really good market for. Uh, another benefit to us in the beginning was that we you don't need pasture for these animals. It's great to put them on pasture, they'll get really good health benefits, but you don't need pasture for them. You don't need grass or hay for pigs and chickens. So when we first moved in here, we didn't have very many fenced in acres, we didn't have much to work with there. And so we needed to find something that would work more off of a grain. And so chicken and pigs were great for that. They, they both need grain to grow, meat chickens and meat pigs. Another reason we thought they were a good fit for us, excuse me, is because uh, they have a fast conversion. We don't like wintering animals here. We don't have any, we don't have much barn space and dealing with frozen water and feed deliveries, especially back when we didn't have a road to the barn and you had to trudge through the snow. It was very difficult to winter animals. And so with pigs and chickens, we could get them in the spring and be done by the fall and not have to winter animals. So that was a really big plus for us. And then of course, the yummy meat again, just delicious meat. So we focused really on pigs and chickens and that's been the last, we've been farming now six years, running the business, selling product, and that has been the bulk of our product and work. Now we've done other things, we've tried other things at small scale levels, but those have been our focus for the business. Here's the thing though, 
Nothing with farming, nothing with homesteading is a perfect end-all answer to every situation. There are serious downsides to raising pork and chicken. And what was a plus to us years back has now become one of the downsides. The fact that you can raise pigs and chickens primarily on grain is awesome, but it's a double-edged sword because it just means you have to buy a ton of grain. And as you increase the size of your business and the demand for your product, now you have to bring more and more. When I raised two pigs, I would go down to Tractor Supply, I'd buy a couple bags of grain, I'd come home and I'd have enough grain for a couple days and as they got bigger I'd buy you know maybe five bags or so. But as we grew, there was one year that we raised 12 pigs and I had to get delivery, one ton deliveries, every week or two I was getting a truck in. And that's just time organizing the truck, dealing with the, the one ton, uh, we have a system, we have a big hopper to take one ton, but we don't have a great way to load it, so I was hand loading. It's just a lot of work, a lot to handle, and man, the cost of grain, especially if you're trying to target an organic or a non-GMO market like we are here in Connecticut. If people care about that, they'll pay for it, but you got to pay it up front when you're spending the money on the grain. Chicken and pork, they're grain drains. Now, there are ways around it, and uh, some, you know, some people will feed their pigs milk or whey, and that's a great workaround if you have that option. Uh, but for us, these last few years, we've just been focused on grain and just been feeding them and feeding them and feeding them. Uh, ben in the chat box says, is there such a thing as pasture-raised pigs? You can definitely pasture-raise your pigs, but... Here's the thing, they need high quality protein. So even though grass is great for them and they can supplement they can supplement their diet with that grass. Camera just went down, guys. Can you go turn that one on, bud? Thanks. We're back. That one. Go turn that one on. Sorry about that. So um, even though you can use grass to supplement their feed and uh, it will help you cut down on cost a little bit. It You can't just... There we go, we're back. You can't just feed them only grass and expect to grow a pig the size that you want to... Uh, you know, sell to someone. So yes, it is great to pasture your pigs and your chickens. Same thing. It's great to pasture them. You get a better quality product, healthier, maybe a yummier product with that. But you can't do it just on grass. And that is because they are not ruminants. Let's talk about ruminants. Ruminants are designed to grow and produce off of grass. For tens of thousands of years, these animals have been munching on grass and converting it into meat and milk. Ruminants are a great solution to producing for your own family and for a business if you have grass if you have good pastures. Now we have experimented with ruminants in the past. We, you guys probably remember us talking about owning goats and sheep. We owned, we did the math recently, we did a video about goats and uh, we had 16, I have owned 16 different goats in the six or five years, I guess it was about five or maybe even four years that we actually owned goats. So in like four or five years, I owned 16 different goats. And I tried all different types, and we'll get to that in a little bit, the ones I like. But anyway, we had done the ruminant thing. And the reason it didn't work last time around is because of the lack of pasture. We only had a little bit of pasture. We mostly had to run them on our lawn where the kids played. And that meant you had, you know, poop, you know, big old sheep poop and goat poop all over the place, uh, which wasn't great. So the worst part about it was the lack of pasture meant we were trying to put them in the woods with electric netting, portable electric netting. We had a lot of high brushy, you know, 
bushy areas we were trying to put them in, weedy areas. It was really hard to fence them properly and keep a good, you know, electric shock going through your fence without it grounding out. There were poisonous plants that were in our woods that we hadn't wiped out. We had issues with that. And then we just didn't have enough space for them, so we dealt with worm problems. And we've talked about this before in, in past videos. So it wasn't right for us. At the time, ruminants was just a bad fit. And it was the same thing with the sheep. We just didn't have enough good pasture. And uh, we didn't have enough, uh, enough space to work everything. And so we decided to get rid of every all our ruminants. Well, that was then. This is now. <laughs> and uh, now we have much bigger pastures. We have tons of space. We've probably tripled, maybe even quadrupled the amount, the area. We've ripped out all the poisonous plants. We don't have the mountain laurel and the rhododendron anymore. Those were the, the main problem issues. And uh, now we're looking at this property, which is we're growing this nice forage and we're thinking we could jump into a much larger scale meat operation now. Our family's growing. We're burning through meat more than we ever have in the past. And I have a baby who's not even eating meat yet and still we're just tearing through it. So our family needs more meat. But then our business, we have customers for our pork who I know if next year I said to them, hey, I have, in addition to pork, I have lamb or I have beef, uh, I could probably move much more. I could probably double my product. Don't know if I told them I had goat. Don't know how that would go over with some of them. <laughs> but goat is delicious. We'll get to that too in a little bit. But anyway, we have been going back and forth with this. And so for reasons for our family, for our business, We've decided we gotta we gotta increase the amount of meat that we're producing. But what kinds are we going to do? That's what we haven't decided yet. And there's some really big factors that we want to consider when making this decision. So first, you got to think about um, what we've talked about: the fact that we have all this grass. Uh, now we have the space for it. We can really cut down on some of the the stress points or the tough points that we've been dealing with over these past years, focusing more on grass-fed ruminants. We won't have to worry as much about grain sourcing. It's hard to find a local source of feed that's GMO-free, if that's something you're interested in, or that's organic. When you do find those sources, it's uh, expensive. It's always very pricey to go that route. Uh, then getting the grain deliveries and the pickups. Just this week, I had a one-ton delivery from my the farm that we get our grain from. And the truck, I told them, I called them up and I said, listen, I need a small, they call it a straight truck. When you picture like one of those delivery trucks, it's not a tractor trailer. It doesn't articulate. Just a straight truck with the big, kind of like the U-Haul truck. Uh, I needed one of those. And I couldn't get anything smaller or anything bigger into the farm well they sent me a tractor trailer and i the guy gets to my road he can't get in my driveway how are we going to get one ton of feed from the road now all the way back into the barn so just issues like this make it very very difficult and hard to do uh, so working through those ruminants fix that ruminants don't need so much grain um Ruminants don't need so much deliveries as far as deliveries go. Now, you will need hay in the winter, and if you don't do your own hay, you'll have to get a hay delivery. But for us personally, hay is not hard to get. I have a local farmer who will bring it in his truck, and now that we have a road to our barn, I can plow out the road, and he can deliver it no problem. And the guy helps me load the hay. It's nice and light. It's great. So all these issues, ruminants fix. And it would be probably... Uh, a lot more cost effective to be doing hay in a few winter months than grain for the entire lifespan. Another thing that makes it less of a burden buying that expensive feed is when you get a $20 super chat from your friends at Greenbrier Farms over there on YouTube. Guys, thank you so much. That is amazing. And the super chats are how we're able to do these shows and these videos. So guys, thank you so much. We really appreciate that. Greenbrier Farms, you guys are great. So now that we have solved 
uh, we, we think we could solve some of these issues. Uh, we, and we think we can get around the issues that we had previously with the ruminants because we have more pasture without the poisonous plants. We're trying to answer this next question, which is if we're going to get into the world of ruminants, we have to pick which ones are the best for this property. And this is a really fun question as a homesteader. There's a lot of different ruminants. You got sheep, you got goats, you got cows. What are the right ones for you? Each of them have their pros and cons. What's going to work best? This is what we're going back and forth with. And this is what we're going to talk about after we come back from a word from our sponsors. Uh, so stay tuned, guys. We're going to take a quick commercial break. And... Uh, after the commercial break, we're going to talk about the pros and the cons of sheep, of goats, and of cows for both meat and dual purpose, and which ones are right for maybe your homestead, and we'll talk about which ones we think are going to be the right fit for our own homestead. So we're going to cut to commercial here, guys. We will be back in just a minute. Hey, and I'm Nurse Craig Alton, and we're here to get you medically prepared. prepared. A lot can happen in the uncertain future, future natural, natural disasters, disasters, epidemics, terror events, but we're here with medical kits and supplies that will help make you... So guys, over on YouTube, as usual, your ad is just a reminder that we're able to do these live shows with the Super Chat. And guys like Greenbrier Farms, man, that is incredible. We're really, really thankful for that Super Chat. So if you want to give even $1... Uh, most of our YouTube videos don't even earn a dollar. <laughs> we have some ones that earn good money, but most of them earn less than a dollar. Uh, so if you want to leave even one dollar, it makes a huge difference. That video's income spikes. And uh, the way to do it, in the chat box, you hit that little dollar sign. It's Check called Super Chat, Network, and you can Fire donate one dollar, you can donate gold. whatever. We're gold appreciative of every little bit. And of course, another way to support the show is by becoming a home study pioneer. Our pioneers are helping us keep this show going. And we're going to talk about the end of this show tonight. Uh, we've lost one of our biggest sponsors. The pioneers have helped us keep going. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. So thank you. When disaster strikes and your GPS is useless, ancient navigation techniques will ensure your survival. New from Ulysses Press, Prepper's Survival Navigation. With this guide, you can, you can easily, easily travel, travel through even the, the farthest, farthest remotest, remotest places, places utilizing, utilizing tips from, from the United States, States Army and, and lifelong wilderness, wilderness experts. experts. You'll, You'll learn life-saving life navigation, navigation techniques. This, this definitive guide, guide to terrain, terrain navigation also teaches you essential survival, survival skills, skills like, like firecraft, water, water procurement, and shelter, shelter making. Prepper's survival navigation is essential to have on hand during any outdoor adventure, including the weekend family outing. On sale now. Find Prepper's survival navigation on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Prepper Broadcasting, or wherever fine books are sold. Okay. So, sheep, goats, and cows. Which are right for us in our homestead? What would be best for you? We got a half hour. We're going to give probably about 10 minutes to each of these. And if you have questions, again, fire them off in the chat box. We'll try to leave a little bit of time at the end to cover your questions. So, first, let's talk about sheep. We raised, when we had sheep here on our homestead, we raised two different kinds. We had Wiltshire Horn and St. Croix. And we can get into these specific breeds we have in other videos. You can check out those videos uh, over on YouTube. Uh, but primarily we picked these two breeds because they were very hardy. We didn't have many issues with um, we didn't we didn't have a lot of problems with them and the herd we got them from was a very hardy i'm sorry the flock we got them from sheep people would be mad at me if i called it a herd uh, the flock that we got them from was a hardy hardy flock uh, the st croix are what's called pulled so you don't get horns on them wiltshires you do have horns um, but they make a really great cross those two together and so that's what we were raising and they, like i said you can check out some of our other videos on youtube to hear more details about them but we picked uh, for a year, for about a year, we had some, a ewe who was pregnant and then gave birth. And we had 
a uh, ram. And some of the best things about the sheep and these in particular, one, they can be totally grass-fed. The flock that we got ours from are a totally grass-fed flock. A grain is used only as a tool to get them to cooperate if they need to give them a little treat. Um, another benefit of sheep, another pro, is lamb is a premium product. People will, s will spend lots of money buying grass-fed lamb. So that was a great, you know, great benefit to raising these. You can do feeders with sheep. So you could buy a couple lambs early in the year, raise them throughout the season, and then by the fall have them butchered. And uh, you don't, again, you don't have to winter an animal. So I'm a big fan of whatever you can do feeder-wise. Lamb means if you do winter some lambs, because of the fact that you're selling the lamb, if you do keep sheep rather, because of the fact that you're selling the lamb, you, you butcher the lambs in the fall, and that means you keep only your ewes and your rams throughout the winter. So that's less animals to care for over the winter, which we live in the Northeast. Some of you guys are thinking like, boy, this guy really is, is a sissy throughout winter time. But it is hard in the Northeast when you get a lot of snow to take care of your animals the right way. It just makes things more and more difficult, especially during a bad winter. Another benefit to sheep are just they're an easy animal to handle. They're easy to keep. They're small. If you have good electric fencing, they respect electric really well. If you have, you know, hard fenced areas, it's not they're not escape artists. So they're just a nice nice animal to have. You can breed your own, you can keep a a lamb and a keep saying lamb. You can keep a sheep and a ram. Maybe that's why, because they kind of mesh into lamb. <laughs> you can keep a sheep and a ram and breed your own, not too difficult. And because they're a smaller ruminant, you need less pasture than some of the other options. In fact, the lamb and the sheep that we were raising was the smallest of the ruminants that we had. They were smaller than most of the goats that we owned and definitely smaller than any cows we have considered. So lamb, lots of pros. Now there are some cons to lamb. In our area, and these are very specific to us, these pros and cons. You guys might have a different, you might put certain things in your pros that I would put in my cons and vice versa. But one of the cons for us in this area, it's hard to find a butcher who will do lamb. Lamb are very small and a butcher who's getting paid by the pound, he's not gonna make much money butchering lambs. So most butchers don't wanna even bother. You can find some of them, but not, not easily. And the one that we use most of the time doesn't like to do that. <coughs> another, another con is if you're doing lamb for meat, you are getting very little meat for yourself. So you have to raise a lot of them to really fill that freezer up. It's delicious meat, but you're not getting a whole lot. And another one I find in our area, although it is a premium product and you can sell a lot of it at certain times of the year, holiday times, uh, seasonally, people like lamb for certain special meals. Overall, it's a tough one to move every month year round. So people will tell you like, oh, I'll definitely buy some lamb for you and they'll buy it once for a special meal and then you'll have more sitting in the freezer. So those are the pros and the cons of lambs. And we are considering lambs, bringing them back on. Let's talk about goats. I love goats and I hate goats. We have videos that we talked about on our YouTube channel, this like back and forth battle with goats. And they're so personable, they're like pets, and then they annoy the heck out of you. So pluses and minuses right there out of the gate. I love and hate goats all at the same time. But there are certain breeds that we have worked with that I find are much, much better, easier, better fits for homesteading than others. And like I said, we've owned a lot of different kinds of goats, 16 different actual animals. And in that we've owned Alpines, we've owned La Manchas, we've owned Nigerian dwarfs, we've owned Nubians, uh, we've owned mutts, you know, different mixes. We've owned sanins. We've had ones that were milking, ones that were more meat. Like I said, all kinds of different goats. So what are the pros? Why would you want to bring 
goats onto your homestead. You can see in this picture, if you're watching on YouTube, we got a nice photo of a bunch of goats in our front yard mowing the lawn there. Goats are a great dual purpose animal. They're depending on the breed, you can get good milk and meat. So we're going to specifically talk about Nubians because of all the goats I've tried, I have found a certain line of Nubians that are incredibly good growers of, for meat. They get very, very big and they produce lots of good tasting milk. So for the rest of this discussion, we're gonna talk about the Nubians, full-size Nubians. I don't mess with mini Nubians. Just get a big full-size goat and work with that. So Nubians can be really good dual purpose. Now, the particular line does matter. There are some skinny Nubians out there that aren't gonna give you much meat. And there's some um, you know, low, uh, low quality milking animals in every line. So you gotta get a good line, but good dual purpose. Nubians need very little grain. You can grass feed Nubians. Now, if you want to really beef them up, grain's not going to hurt. Um, but again, part of the pros of the ruminants is you need less grain for the animal. You can give them some, but you don't need to do it like you do for pigs. Goat meat is awesome. It tastes delicious. And you can get more off of meaty, like a meaty Nubian, than you will off of most of your sheep or your lambs. A lot of people have never tried goat and some people have tried it maybe once, maybe they're not, they, they don't think they like it. But my butcher, who he's got very select taste, he's been a butcher for you know decades, the guy's great. He says he'll take grass-fed goat over a grass-fed beef any day. He really, really likes goat. And I agree, goat can be so good and grass-fed, it does a nice job. Kendra makes some really good curries, which are just fantastic. And... Uh, so really delicious meat. These particular breed, Nubian, are not as hard to handle or keep as other goats. Nubians are a little bit heavier on the hoof. They're not going to be the jumpers. We owned a La Mancha. We owned a couple La Manchas. I will never, ever again in my life own a La Mancha goat because they are escape artists. They are pure evil. <laughs> La Manchas are trouble. And they love to escape. They'll go under your fence, through your fence, over your fence. They're trouble. Nubians, they're a bit heavier. They're not going to climb up as much. They're never going to jump over your fence. They're a little bit easier to keep as far as goats go. Another pro to the goat is you can breed your own. You could keep a doe and a buck pretty easily. Now, keeping a buck, that might be in the cons because bucks can get stinky. Uh, but if you got a nice, good-sized farm and you don't mind, I personally don't mind the smell of a, a buck in rut. It doesn't bother me. It, you know, it's a strong smell, but we own pigs, so we're used to strong smells. It's not a bad thing if you're used to farm smells. So you can breed your own. And again, a goat needs less pasture than a larger ruminant like a cow. And goats can do really well on your weeds and your scrub brush and all the really low quality pasture. So if you don't have good pastures, you can do pretty, <clears throat> excuse me, you can do pretty good with goats. But Remember, you got to check for those poisonous plants because they can do a really, uh, they can do a number on your herd. They can kill your animals. So make sure you don't have any of those poisonous plants in your pastures before you get the goats there. Now let's talk about the cons of goats. Another animal might be tough to find a butcher for. You're not getting a lot of meat off of them. Butcher gets paid by the meat amount. So not great. They're not a premium product. People aren't going to be searching out grass-fed goat and paying you a lot of money, even though they should be. Maybe a little bit of education. Maybe you give some free goat to some of your poor customers and you win them over that way. Uh, but they're not a premium product. They will take longer than lamb to produce. Lamb, you're selling the actual lambs. Goats, generally, you'll wait till they're a bit older and grown more. So that could take more time. You might have to winter more animals which means hay and winter or sorry hay and water issues and housing issues over the winter. Uh, you don't get a ton of meat off the goat when compared to like raising a beef, so you will have to raise more to get that same kind of meat. Uh, and goats as in general are more escape artists and can be harder to keep and harder to fence. Remember, that depends a lot on the breed. So if you have a goat that uh, like a La Mancha like we did, you may have an animal that's almost impossible to keep in the fence.
We got a visitor here. You want to grab him? Bring him over. My uh, my one-year-old just stumbled in. Somebody didn't shut the door to the studio too well. <laughs> hey, who's that? You're going to have a guest. Guest on the air. Say hi, buddy. You say hi? All right. You going to see mommy now? Off you go. So, lots of pros to the goats, also some cons. Lots to consider when making this decision. <laughs> you like that? Seeing him stumble in. So, what are we going to do? The final question, what about cows? Let's get into cows. Special thank you to Ben Newman. Ben just gave us a $5 super chat. He says, great show today. Glad that you like it, Ben. I figured this would be a pretty popular one, talking about all this livestock. Thank you, Ben. Can't do it without you guys. It's incredible. So let's talk about cows. The pros, you get a ton of meat off of a cow. Even some of the smaller breeds can yield a lot of product. I was talking with my butcher, and he said that the meat Devons are a smaller breed, but they're like a 55 gallon drum. You can get as much off of a meat Devon as you can off of a, maybe a Hereford or an Angus. Almost the same amount of meat on a smaller framed animal. So as a homesteader, that's a pretty good thing. Grass-fed beef definitely is a popular premium product. I bet you, and now I've never sold grass-fed beef because we've never raised it, but I know our local market and I'm sure I could move it probably easier than our pork. So if I have my pork customers, I could double my, my income right there. It's easy to sell grass-fed beef, and people will pay good money for grass-fed beef. So it's a premium product that's easy to sell. You can do feeders. You can buy you know, a, a steer from someone and raise it for a year and a half uh, to three years, depending on the breed and the time when you purchase it. Uh, but you will have to winter a cow. You're not going to be able to do a finish a cow unless you do maybe a veal. And even then it's going to be, you know, you're going to be slipping it in there. Um, definitely easier to find a butcher for. Butchers love butchering cows because they can charge a lot of money for it. That's a lot of meat to process. So that's another pro. And cows are easy to fence. You see, you drive by a cow farm and they got one single strand of tape, electric tape. It's ridiculous what will keep a cow in. So really a lot of pros there. Cons, they're slower growing. You're gonna need to winter animals, so you gotta be able to handle that. They need lots of hay and water in the winter. You're gonna be doing straight up hay throughout the winter and maybe some grain to supplement their diet. Uh, and then water, keeping their water from freezing. This is an issue and they're gonna need a lot of it. They're a larger animal, so then you got to worry about handling a larger animal. You will need a livestock trailer. So I have delivered more goats than I care to mention in the back of my minivan. But with a cow, even a mini one, you're not going to get it in the back of your minivan. So you're definitely going to need to make a purchase of a livestock trailer, and that's a, that's a good size purchase, so that's something to consider. They need more pasture, and they need quality pasture. So if you're going to get a cow, you need a lot more space. So those are the pros and the cons of the cow, which leads us the last 15 minutes of the show to talk about what in the world are we going to do on our homestead and hopefully get to a couple of your guys' questions. So what are we going to do? I don't have an answer yet. <laughs> the one thing I have learned in life, mostly from strategy based computer games is you can't just have one thing you need to diversify do i have any starcraft fans out in the audience tonight fire it up in the chat box i'll just say zergling i'll just leave it at that but uh you don't want to have just one thing now it's good to go slow and steady in the beginning it's good to maybe start with one thing but we've already owned goats and we've already owned sheep uh, so we know ourselves what they're like and what to expect so we could get maybe two. Here's the thing though, when you diversify, 
you can't go too much on the you know don't diversify too much because with every breed every different you know animal you bring on they'll need their own housing they'll need their own feed you can't mix those good example is sheep and goats you would think hey i can just feed them all the same thing but problem with that one of the animals copper kills and the other needs copper so you feed sheep and goats the same thing you're killing one and the other or you're leaving the other deficient of something that it needs so it's issues like that that make you make it difficult to diversify too much you need to make sure you can separate the different kinds of animals so it works good if you can follow people in order different you know follow the sheep behind the goats behind the cows but just make sure you have enough housing and space for everyone before you diversify too much I don't think having all three is going to work for us. Maybe we'll alternate year for year with maybe we get some feeder lambs along with a big old beef. Uh, maybe we get some goats then along with the beef. The The real solution for us, if I had to guess right now, and we've, as you know, if you've been following us on YouTube and here on Prepper Broadcasting, we've talked about it a lot. Um, we've been thinking a lot about doing cows. So if I had to guess, I would say... There is a meat cow in our near future or a dairy cow that we then breed to a meat cow. And so that steer we raise for meat. Whether or not we do a lot of cows as like a big business is another thing. I just don't know that we have a lot of, uh, a lot of space for that. We definitely need more space if we're going to do beef as a business. And so maybe as we clear more and more over the years, we could do more beef cows. But I'm sure you will see in the future a beef cow of some sort, whether it's a smaller Dexter. We did a video on the Dexters not too long ago. Dexters are one of the smallest meat breeds of cows. They dress out at about 200 pounds, which just to give you an idea, that's what my pigs dress out at. So very small, um, but they can be totally grass fed. The beef is incredible quality. We tasted some of the Dexter from the farm that we went to visit. It was outstanding. So maybe we'll go the Dexter route. They do take they do take a long time to um, to finish, about three years. So that's one of the downsides there. Uh, but I think you'll see probably some sort of beef animal here, and then in addition to that, you'll probably see a maybe some goats, maybe some dual purpose Nubians, uh, maybe some feeder lambs. Maybe we alternate. So that's what we've that's what we've come to decide is the right solution for us. Turn that one on. It's off. That one. So stay tuned. That's the best answer I have for you guys. Stay tuned and see what we wind up bringing on the farm. We're bouncing back and forth with all these different ideas, and there's a. L I think the the biggest thing that's driving us is we need a lot more meat. So I think the beef is definitely going to happen or the dual, you know, milk slash beef animal because we just need to fill these freezers. <laughs> In addition to that, we will cut back on pigs and scale up maybe with the sheep or the goats. So that's where we've been left at. Now, guys, I have seen some questions tonight. This has been a very popular topic and I want to make sure we get to your questions. So tag at Homesteady and if you'd like to call in, if we can have that number, let's see, in the chat box. Doesn't look like it's there yet, guys. If you could put that in the chat box and I'll put it over on YouTube too. So guys, let's get to your questions. We're gonna start at the top. So the first question that I found, why not rabbits? The Garden Channel wants to know. We will definitely try rabbits as a, an improvement over maybe doing meat chickens one year. Rabbits have some incredible benefits. We didn't talk about them tonight because they're not a huge meat producer. Um, and we didn't cover really meat chickens much because we're looking at the bigger animals. But rabbits are great protein, e way easier to butcher yourself, good quality meat. I like rabbit. Um, the only reason we haven't done it is that we had a long time looking for a good source of it. Now we have a local source. And I think in a year or two, we'll wind up trying rabbits. So that'll be in the future. John Henry asks, why raise pigs slash cattle when you can hunt deer and hogs? 
We've been meat independent for three years because of hunting slash raising Cornish crosses and turkey. Organic and delicious. John Henry, awesome, man. Congrats for being meat independent for that long with a combination of homesteading and hunting. That's my kind of guy right there. So why not us? Well, John, you probably know, I know you've been on our shows before. Um, We got a family of six growing and I love hunting. I'm not as good as I would need to be to feed this family enough venison at the rate that my kids will eat venison. Um, Last year, depending on where I hunt, I do better in Pennsylvania, but I get less tags. And uh, so Connecticut, I see way less deer than I do in Pennsylvania. In Pennsylvania, I get one buck tag usually. Some years I get a doe tag. So I haven't been able to depend on hunting to fix the red meat issue. We used to back before we had four kids. So definitely we do it a lot. We do a lot of hunting to supplement that, but we need more meat. And we don't have hogs anywhere near us. So that issue is uh, that's no go for us. But yes, definitely we do that to supplement the freezers. So when I planted these pastures, I asked the woman at the farm where we worked or where we purchased the uh, seed from, I said to them, I want something that's good for cows and everything, but I also want something that works for deer that'll bring the deer in. And usually those two work pretty well together. Deer are like a good pasture. So we have a pasture slash food plot. And in certain areas, the pasture is geared even more towards deer and turkey than it is to the ruminants, depending on the part that we're planting. So great point, John Henry, and we're considering that too. Okay, I'm looking for our next question here. Let's see here. All right, let's see. I don't see any in the Prepper Broadcasting. I don't see any questions. So if you have a question over at Prepper Broadcasting, guys, just re-ask the question so it bumps down lower in the feed. I see a lot of discussion about emus. (laughs) We're never doing emus. Sorry, guys. Uh, Ben says, we move every two to three years because of work, but we want to do pet as we say to our renters sheep <laughs> pretty good what breed would you suggest for many in climates in the u.s so what breed for most climates in the u.s mm. what do you want um, when are we done? a little bit i love the wiltshire horn and saint croix the saint croix is my favorite uh, because it's pulled it's hardy but it doesn't yield as big of a lamb as when you cross them with the Wiltshire horn. My uh, the, the flock that I'm basing this off of, my in-laws have a, my, it's my wife's aunts, have a very big farm, excuse me, with a huge flock of sheep. And the, the sheep on that property are fantastic. I've watched them. I've seen them. Their hardiness, uh, they're very worm-resistant. Uh, so they don't have a whole lot of worm issues. Uh, so if you have those in your area, that's a great, great way to go. Uh, the St. Croix are pulled. The, the um, Wiltshire horn are not. So they are horned. So John Henry followed up that question with pulled or horned. If you cross them, I don't know what you get every time. I think that's kind of up in the air. Um, so the thoughts, John Henry wants to know, should they be pulled or horned? I don't worry too much about coyotes. He wanted to know how to coyotes um you know do they have to protect themselves from coyotes with good fencing and good management that's not a huge issue for us where we are but it is for bigger herds i know it is for them um that's just one of those things so usually it's a younger animal or a sicker animal that they're going to get so good question from uh the prepper broadcasting looks like flying dutchman says how hard is it to deal with health inspection to sell meat great question there are loopholes you can use and your state it will depend state to state we use a very good loophole here in connecticut it's totally legal i you know it's a loophole because it's a good workaround but what it is it's selling an animal live so you can sell an animal to a customer while the animal's alive and say okay now that's your pig and hey i'll deliver it just for your convenience to the butcher so you sell the animal live, 
you bring it down to the butcher, now it's his animal. So great way to work around the health inspection, but to do that, they have to buy a whole animal and you have to find people to split it if they don't wanna buy a whole animal. Otherwise, depending on your situation, if your butcher is USDA inspected, it's not a big deal. Um, if he isn't, then it may be a bigger deal. So a lot depends on your state, Flying Dutchman, but hopefully that helps. Guys, we got a ton of questions tonight. I'm afraid we're just not going to have time to cover all of them. We'll have to revisit this subject. But I wanted to make sure to give you a little bit of a heads up uh, before we finish our show out. Uh, our weekly live show will be stopping for a time. And um, the reason why is because we we lost our biggest our biggest sponsor for the winter into the spring was Audible. And uh, we've lost Audible. They were a big supporter of the show. They had some restructuring with their budget. And they couldn't keep going with homesteading. And so we did a survey over at thisishomesteady.com, which is still up. You can still voice your opinion. If you want me to change my mind, go and take that survey. It's thisishomesteady.com. You can fill out the survey there, and it asks, what do you want us to produce? But so far, unfortunately, the weekly live show that we do right now has been the least popular thing. And with the budget cut, we need to cut something. And uh, we want to cut, we want to listen to the audience. So let us know, guys. Go to thisishomesteady.com. Let us know what you love. If you love the podcast most, we're, we're never going to stop doing the podcast, so don't worry about that. Um, but if you love YouTube the most, let us know. If you love this live show, if you're listening on Prepper Broadcasting, or if you're listening later over at Blog Talk, through Blog Talk Radio, or whatever it is, take the survey. Let us know. For the time being, it looks like our weekly live show is going to take a break, at least for the summer. It'll give us a little time to hopefully find some replacements. Uh, thank goodness to our Homesteady Pioneers who and our Super Chatters who have been helping to support this show. Because without you guys, we wouldn't have any support. And uh, it would have been impossible to continue producing pretty much almost anything. Um, so our Homesteady Pioneers have been a huge support. And I wanted to thank you guys specifically. If you want to become a Pioneer, it's 5 bucks a month. You get a ton of bonus content. We have master classes and uh, bonus episodes of the podcast and videos over at thisishomesteady.com. Five bucks a month gets you access to that, and it helps us to produce the show when our sponsors disappear. So fortunately, we took a little time. We have found uh, some new sponsors, which we'll be happy to announce, but nobody has signed up like Audible did for a weekly show. So right now, we're going to be cutting some things back. If you want to let us know what you want cut and what you want to have us keep, this is homesteady.com. The survey takes like three minutes to fill out. I timed it. And uh, we are we're, our team is meeting on Friday to go over that survey. Accountant Mike is going through the numbers. He's going to tell us where to give the thumbs up and the thumbs down. But I've been reviewing the data, and right now the weekly live stream is not looking like the fan favorite. So let us know if you want us to change our mind on that. Um, we've really enjoyed doing this and there will be more live things in the future even if it's just a special occasion kind of thing thank you so much we'll be back next week for our final Homesteady Live episode for now and uh, we'll be there answering questions we'll announce the topic in a short time and until then guys thanks for joining us tonight thanks for some great questions the road is rocky keep Homesteady we'll see you for our last Homesteady Live show next week You've just joined the Prepper Broadcasting Network, where we promote self-reliance and independence. The views and opinions expressed are strictly those of the host or their guests. Visit us in the interactive chat room at PrepperBroadcasting.com.